I can get started um, then. It is um, Wednesday, November 15th, 2023. Um, it's 8.02 a.m. And um, I call this third meeting of the Act 65 working group to order. Um, I know Julie is on the road. She's going to be walking in this door any minute now, but I think um, she's joined by uh, the link for now. So before we get started, I'd like to approve the minutes from our second meeting, um, which was on uh, September 28th, 2023. And again, because I think this is really just a special meeting of the Cannabis Control Board, I think it's just Julie, Kyle, and I that need to approve those minutes. So have you guys had a chance to look at them? Yes. And is there a motion to approve? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, great. All right. So I'm just going to plug this in. Okay. Connect. Right. So um, just a few administrative details. Um, as always, I just want to remind everyone that this is a public meeting that's being recorded. Um, the recording is a public document. It lives on our YouTube channel for the indefinite future. So I just you know, mentioned that for any um, patients or caregivers that are joining today that might have privacy or confidentiality concerns, um, if you do not want to be recorded, you have a couple of options. If you join via the video link, um, you can turn off your camera and change the name that it appears or the initials that appear on the screen by editing your profile. There's a few little kind of helpful like guides on how to do that right here. Um, you can also just exit out of the meeting altogether and watch on YouTube after the fact and then submit comments through our, our public comment portal. Um, this meeting is scheduled for two hours. We actually have a hard stop today at 10 o'clock. Um, we have another training that we're doing at 10 o'clock. Um, my plan is to present information that's relevant to the specific topics that are outlined in Act 65, um, then pause at various points. Um, for comments, questions, and feedback. Um, we're going to do our best to give each identified group of stakeholders equal time. Um, we'll strive to let people talk as long as they want and make repeat comments if they want, but I um, will prioritize first time commenters over people who have already commented. Um, just remind folks to just please be respectful of the other participants. There's very little utility um to the ccb with participants engaging in a back and forth with people they don't agree with so just a quick recap of the first uh two meetings at the first meeting we reviewed the specific charge of act 65 we looked at the history of the medical program including some of the structural challenges it's facing then we charted a path forward for the next few meetings the primary focus of the second meeting um, was around which conditions should qualify a patient for access to the medical registry and how we can move towards a more evidence-based approach for adding new qualifying conditions. We also heard from Jesse Lynn Dolan about the Cannabis Nurses Hotline, which has been providing information to patients um, and adults that are curious about using cannabis for symptom relief. So um, just quickly reviewing this legislative charge, um, the kind of key factors of it. Um, this is a working group of interested stakeholders and experts that's convened by the CCB um, in order to review these kind of five discrete topics about cannabis and symptom relief, and then kind of a sixth more broad charge uh, about general improvements to the medical use program. Um, I say this at every meeting, um, just want to reiterate that I don't expect us all to agree on what the final recommendations that come out of this uh, working group will be. Um, Ultimately, this is going to be a report generated uh, with recommendations that the CCB feels are the most important, um, and it's going to be informed by this process and the stakeholders. Um, I appreciate that um, almost everything we propose is going to require some form of legislation. 
Um, so anyone who disagrees with any of our recommend recommendations will have an opportunity to be heard um, through the kind of appropriate legislative channels at the appropriate time. No. Oh. Um, this is okay, the third of it's okay, four it's meetings. It's all right. Um, this is the third of uh, four meetings. At the fourth meeting, um, I will be presenting what I think are the best um, rec the draft recommendations um, and seek input from the name stakeholders. I'll try and get those recommendations out before that meeting so people can be prepared to comment on them. Um, I'm hoping to schedule that for early December um, so that we have enough time to incorporate everyone's feedback into the final report, which again is due January 15th. Um, so we'll keep our event calendar up to date on our website um, and have the links to join and the agendas available there. Finally, I'd like to just very briefly introduce the um, members of this working group that are named. Um, so I'll start with the CCB team. Um, Kyle Harris is sitting right next to me. Julie Holbert, um, I don't know if you want to wave quickly for the camera, Julie. I think you have to say something if you want to. Yep, I'm I am okay. here. I'm I'm almost to the office. Thank you. Great. Yep. Thank you, Julie. Um, and then the CCB staff that oversees the medical program. Our director of licensing is Kimberly Lashua. Um, and then our deputy director of licensing is Melissa Anderson. Melissa, would you mind just uh, just saying hello? Okay. <laughs> um, and then we have Priya Holland. Priya, you have to say something, otherwise the video won't pop up on our end. Hello. Thank you. And then Isabel Center. Good morning. Great. Thank you very much. And then um, from the academic detailing program, we have Dr. McLean. Hi there. And then um, I think, you know, the rest of the folks that have joined, we have uh, representatives from the medical cannabis dispensaries, we have medical professional stakeholders, and then we have registered patients and caregivers. So I'm not going to go through the remaining uh, folks one at a time, um, but the, the, the remaining people in the, in the room and in this meeting all represent one of those various interests. So um, today I want to um, think about the testing and labeling of medical cannabis. Um, obviously, testing and labeling are the foundation of a regulated market. There's differing opinions about the therapeutic effects of cannabis, but I don't think there's any disagreement that consumers deserve a product that's free from harmful contaminants and is accurately labeled with the right information. Um, this is, of course, even more critical for medical patients that may have compromised immune systems or re require very specific combinations of certain cannabinoids and terpenes. Um, and yet, while the adult use system has very stringent testing regulations, our medical program rules did not mandate any sort of specific testing methodologies, action levels, or independence, um, you know, third party testing. And I don't mean to begrudge the kind of predecessor agency um, or the dispensaries for this shortcoming in the rules. At the time those rules were drafted, um, there were no third party labs um, that were willing or able to test cannabis. Um, the Department of Public Safety and the Agency of Agriculture actually in 2018 wrote a report asking the legislature for funding to conduct more comprehensive testing on medical products um, that, that was not granted to them. Um, so this has been a known deficiency of the program for some time, and um, we now have kind of an opportunity and a responsibility to fix it. But um, just as every new mandate has a cost, um, we need to make sure that whatever testing and labeling we require is necessary for consumer education and health actually adds value um, and does not result in products being unaffordable. So in order to help us strike that balance, um, I've invited Dr. Ari Kirschenbaum, formerly of St. Mike's College, um, now a full-time researcher for the Cannabis Public Policy Consulting Group, um, who's been doing some very exciting work in a number of states uh, trying to improve their medical programs. 
Um, you know, the legislature asked us to think about specific strains or active compounds in the cannabis plant that may have therapeutic effects for certain conditions or symptoms. So I asked Ari um, to help us understand the constituent components of cannabis and how they interact with each other, um, both in isolation and in concert uh, with one another, with the ultimate goal of helping inform us as to what we should be putting on labels, testing for and putting on labels. Um, I know a lot of this information is going to be second nature to some of our participants here today, but it's very important for our purposes that we have this information as part of our record and that we all have a common understanding um, and the ability to ask questions about this aspect of our legislative request. So Ari, um, let me turn things over to you. And um, I would just ask the people, unless you have a very burning question that's highly relevant to just hold your questions to the end. I think Ari has a quick presentation for us and then we're gonna um, have a, Q a little bit of Q and A. Did I do you justice, Ari? <laughs> sure, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here and uh, it's really wonderful to be uh, sitting in with a group of Vermonters. Um, but I think that you'll need to allow me to share my PowerPoint presentation. Um, so who's ever running the uh, the tech here? Let me see if we can. All right, yeah, quickly. I got it. Yeah. Okay, okay, great. Thanks, Kyle. Not the best tech guy, but that one I could do. Okay. Give me just a minute here. All right, um, let me just make sure that you can see the PowerPoint presentation that I'm sharing. Yeah, we see right. it. Good, and uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. All right. So I think that I wanted to just describe a little bit about what kind of what cannabis policy consulting is and what we do. Um, we are a, a team of researchers. Uh, there are 15 of us and policy consultants. Uh, many of us are um, Masters in public health, and a few of us have PhDs in various disciplines. And the goal is to really provide uh, states, with mostly departments of public health, but with some information about what uh, their residents are doing and how they're using their cannabis. Uh, we've also consulted for Congress. We've consulted for uh, the FDA and the CDC. Uh, just a little bit about, more about me. I think that uh, it probably makes sense for you to know a little bit about uh, who your messenger is here today. Um, I consider myself to be a comparative neuropsychologist and uh, psychopharmacologist. Uh, so what that means is that I've studied a variety of different drugs. When I was a tenured professor at St. Michael's College, I had grants from the NIH and uh, the National Science Foundation to study a variety of different drugs. I came to the state in uh, 2001 uh, to help with the opioid epidemic uh, and to be involved with a treatment program at the University of Vermont Medical Center. Um, so, and I have a lot of background in, in tobacco. So I think that what this comparative approach does is it allows us to, I hope anyway, to think about cannabis, not just in isolation, but how it might function as a drug relative to other drugs. Um, when we think about, for instance, cannabis use disorder, we need to think about that in context of both alcohol use disorder and opioid use disorder, uh, among other things. And a focus of my research for the last five to 10 years has been on the impairing effects of cannabis. Um, so this is one of just one of the many things that we do at uh, Cannabis Policy Consulting is that we provide a quarterly survey that we call the Regulatory Determinants of Cannabis Outcomes. And what we do is we uh, deliver the survey, we would deploy it to a variety of, uh, to many people across the nation. And over the last three quarters, we've been able to get 75,000 respondents to this particular survey. And these respondents that we get are sampled from each state in a matter, in a way that, uh, that mirrors the consensus uh, from, uh, you know, the United States consensus for that state. So we think that our samples are truly representative. And I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll begin just briefly giving some, giving you some statistics about the state of Vermont from our last survey. 
So uh, these are some general Vermont statistics. Uh, just take a second to read them. You don't really need to listen to me talk about it. All right, can I just ask the 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 number the uh, the top statistic is that uh, people 21 and older or is that all also all of our residents? These are all of our survey respondents and we had survey respondents going to 18. OK, thanks. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. To interrupt. But uh, no, that's a great question. And uh, James, if we can break this down very easily by age group, if that's something that you're interested in. But I think it's worth noting that each one of these I'm statistics. Sorry, my name is Joe Andriano, uh, representative from the Addison Rutland District. Is this? Uh, Thank you. You're my for... representative. Awesome. Hello, hello. <laughs> is this data for all of the um, uh, for all adult users, or is this data specifically for medical users? This is for all users, but we can awesome. break it down for medical users as well. Great, thank you. Um, and relative to other states that we've seen, uh, there are differences and differences uh, between medical users and recreational users um, and uh, in, in, in ways you might not expect. Uh, so I'm happy to talk about that perhaps some other time. But these are just Vermont statistics. Uh, we only, again, this is a sample of Vermont. Um, so we, for this particular survey, we had about 300 people. Um, and I have to say that each one of these statistics does not really differ significantly from what we're seeing in the national sample. And this final statistic, this correlation between uh, cannabis use disorder that we assess using um, uh, using a standardized uh, set of questions um, for diagnosis of cannabis use disorder in our survey, that we find this strong correlation between CUD and driving under the influence of cannabis, such that we really have to think about driving in the influence of cannabis as a consequence of cannabis use disorder. Uh, we can also break things down by can, uh, by county. So this is uh, the number of mean days that people have uh, driven after using cannabis or within two hours after using cannabis per county. Um, we can also break this down by age group uh, and by uh, frequency of use. So this particular figure right here just shows you that those people who started using cannabis young at 13 currently as an adult tend to use cannabis uh, more frequently and more frequently use is associated with cannabis use disorder. But in the state of Vermont, I think that uh, one of the, I, I was encouraged by this, that the modal age of first use is at 21 years. So just generally what we do is we create data right. and public policy oh, reports. Can I just um, yeah, can I sure. ask a quick question before you move on? Can you just define cannabis use disorder quickly? Like what the condition what what the criteria are for that? Sure. Cannabis use disorder is recognized by the Diagnostic Statistical Manual as one of the many substance use disorders. And like many substance use disorders, it is defined by uh, frequency of use tolerance, the presence of withdrawal uh, symptoms, and then also what it does to things like your interpersonal functioning, um, and also what it does to uh, you know, your ability to perform your job. And um, like many substance use disorders, we see that uh, the probability that somebody is diagnosed with, substance, with cannabis use disorder, it declines over time with age. Uh, so I'm not really quite sure what is happening there, but and there's been a lot of speculation, and this is not just for cannabis use disorder, but the, you know more people are more likely to have cannabis use disorder uh, early on in their young adulthood. Thank you. Does that I appreciate that. Yes, that, that just wanted to contextualize a little bit. Thank you. No, I, that's, these are the kinds of questions that I really like, and I think that they're really informative to contextualize it. And, uh, you know, wow. maybe later we can have a more conversation about what cannabis use I... disorder is like relative to opioid use disorder or alcohol use disorder. But current estimates from national surveys and from ours suggest that cannabis use disorder typically exists around 10% of the population of people who have tried cannabis. So what that means is that 10% of people who try cannabis end up having a hard time uh, stopping. Okay. There is another question. Can we see the driving? Uh, uh, this you you moved the slide very early, very uh, quickly. I didn't see the the. So yeah, th these are just the mean days of driving per county. And my purpose for showing this particular slide was just to say that we have the ability to get county specific data from any of our um, from any of our uh, respondents. 
Uh, and something I should have said early on is that I'm currently an instructor for the state's drug recognition ex expert training program. And part of my job there is to train about the specific ways that cannabis impairs driving. Impaired driving, it, it's an important thing for me. Uh, ever since I was a teenager, I was involved with something called Safe Rides. And I just uh, wanted to make sure that what we could do as a state is to try to uh, deal with uh, drug impaired driving. Now, when it comes to other drugs, I think that there's a, an important conversation to have there about how cannabis impairs driving relative to other drugs, but perhaps that's something we can talk about some other time. But when we're talking about medical labeling, I think it's important to realize that many of our medications, whether they're anxiolytics, painkillers, muscle relaxers, or even at some antidepressants, they all can impair our ability to drive. And that information is provided on the label of our pharmaceutical. I don't see that same kind of labeling happening here in Vermont. Thanks, Ari. And I know sure. I was the first one to break the cardinal rule of letting you get through the presentation. <laughs> but uh, um, I, you know, I, if you're OK to stay maybe a little bit longer than what we scheduled for, we can continue in this fashion. But I, I know you have a lot to get through. Yeah, I have a little bit, but I, I'm here to just really yeah. provide some data to you and answer these questions. So I really appreciate yeah. them. Uh, thanks, James. Yeah. Great. Well, I'll let um, you get so, back to it. Sure. The, these are some other um, uh, questions that we can answer. Uh, and uh, these are some of the uh, data that we provided to Congress when they requested for information about CBD in particular. Um, but certainly we something that's very germane to this conversation today is that what are some of the common barriers to access for medical patients for cannabis? And uh, these are some things that we're seeing in other states. So we can talk about those. I've had some of my policy experts look specifically at the state of Vermont and what our regulations are. And uh, there are some recommendations I can provide today. Uh, there are also things that we can do for the entire state having to do with supply demand analysis, thinking about how much uh, supply is available for those people who uh, choose to purchase cannabis, uh, what, where is that supply coming from, and we can also provide a simulation about what's going to happen perhaps in the future uh, when it comes to sort of pricing of cannabis products and, uh, and use uh, that corresponds to that price. So, I wanted to actually begin with this idea today that uh, this is an idea I'm pitching because I think that this would truly be groundbreaking and it's not something that other states are doing and it's something that can help to answer uh, many of the questions that you pose to me, uh, James. And the idea here is to have a post-consumer survey uh, which assesses the efficacy and tolerability of medical cannabis products. So what this would mean is that you have a QR code on any particular product and that QR code is scanned by uh, the person who is using the medical cannabis. And we provide them with a survey, thinking about a five to 10 minute survey. Now, because that QR code is directly associated with the products that, that somebody's purchasing, we get an immediate we get immediate information about that purchase product description. And this can have everything from THC to CBD to CB, CBN quality, along with the terpenes that are involved in it, uh, anything when it was grown, where it was grown, who it was grown by. Uh, and then in the survey, we would have things like the date and the location of the purchase, the ailment or, di or diagnosis that the person is seeking to treat. And most importantly, I think dose, because dose matters. And we do not have safe dosing guidelines for any cannabis product. So this would be a, a tremendous step forward. We can also talk about success in symptom management, have people respond to adverse reactions. And currently, we in our survey, we have descriptions of adverse reactions. And some of these adverse reactions uh, include things like depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, uh, the psychomimetic effects or the psychotic-like effects that can be produced by cannabis, including, uh, you know, and also hospitalization. So we could, we would directly be able to assess how that product is functioning for that person at that given time. And this could be very important because what it can do is that then we can inform the supply chain meaning that, that if there's a, pr a problem with a product, just like the FDA or USDA would regulate agricultural products, if there is a, for instance, if there's an E. coli response to somebody who had some iceberg lettuce from Watsonville, California, right, we can go back and understand the supply a little bit better and maybe uh, in terms of consumer advocacy, uh, work in a way uh, to prevent more adverse reactions. 
So TNT stands for track and trace. Track and trace is used by a variety of states. We also call it seed to sale supply chain analysis. And uh, I think that some a survey like this could go a long way. But most importantly, I want to emphasize the science that this would help to establish is that this getting information from real consumers and the response to different products may be the most effective way to establish safe, safe dosing thresholds and to elucidate the influence of different strains on symptom relief. This I think is this would be a, a good solution for a lot of people. And again, we would be pioneers uh, in uh, in the nation for doing something like this. Yeah, this is pretty interesting to me as well. Now? Yes, sir. Um, is it is it uh, highly relevant to this topic? I, I just I'm trying to shift questions to the end, but if it's if it's highly relevant to this topic, go go for it. Yeah, if we just go back to the previous slide, uh, it's relevant because I don't see how this is scientific. Um, you know, number one, it's a ran it is a truly random survey, not a sampled survey. Number two, um, you know, to ask people about dose as an example, uh, when I use cannabis, I primarily use a dryer vaporizer, which mm -hmm. more um, is more efficient in extracting the cannabis than um, if someone was to use a joint, um, you know, to burn the cannabis or uh, to take the cannabis in an oral administration route. So, you know, honestly, oral administration is probably the easiest way to count dose. Um, you know, uh, what someone can get from a, from cannabis um, really depends so much based on the method of um, ingestion of it. But but I also look to, you know, you give adverse reactions as, the, as an example, and you gave things examples like depression and anxiety, and many of these can be comorbidities of, um, of the very um, diseases that are are bringing us to cannabis to use anyway. Um, yep. You know, I use cannabis because I have ulcerative colitis. And, um, you know, ulcerative colitis is a very difficult disease to live with and can lead to depression and anxiety when things aren't going well. And so it just seems to me um, that if we were to um, implement the survey in the manner that, you, that you're suggesting here, what we would largely get would be unscientific results that would be highly, um, you know, uh, bias isn't the exact word, but influenced by um, externalities such as comorbidities with the very diseases that we're, that we're using. Um, and so-, so I, Agreed. Yeah. Can, I, can I answer that? Sure, yeah, please, and, please. and can I just say before you do, just I think we're gonna have to hold questions to the end because that was almost more of a comment. I understand the point. I also think there'd be great value to the individual person using this as kind of a log for themselves uh, over time um, to help them understand how their body reacts to cannabis. But um, Dr. Kirschenbaum, I think I'm gonna ask guests to hold their questions and comments till the end, just because we're getting a lot of people raising their hand. And, and But I would like you to just respond and uh, keep, keep going if you're okay. Sure, sure. And, and just a, a quick response to that is that there's a continuum of what we call science. There are experimental studies in which we can control and manipulate an independent variable like the dose involved, and we can be very careful about uh, who we let into our studies, uh, making sure that there are no pre-existing conditions. And uh, I think it, it is uh, because of that that we, uh, you know, that kind of research that we can reach some very strong some strong conclusions about causal influences of cannabis. But I'm of the perspective that sometimes having some external or generalizable generalizability is a really wonderful place to start for science. And although we don't establish causation with a survey, we can get some really good indicators of what the real population is doing. And like the, the comment just now is that there are so many different products out there, so many different ways to consume those products that this might be a really valuable place to start because any lab study cannot begin to approach the different methods of consumption, nor the different products and strains and doses that are available. So I do appreciate that comment. Thank you very much. And um, so I think that th this is a general overview of some, thing some things that I've uh, prepared today for uh, that James asked about. Um, and I can talk about any or all of these. Um, but I felt like, you know, it, it, to begin with, I just want to have a general overview of uh, cannabis pharmacodynamics or how cannabis influences the brain and behavior. So here we have these botanical com uh, components of cannabis, sativa, and we often think about these things as being, you know, uh, the way that these drugs 
you know, these phytocannabinoids interact with their endogenous uh, system, uh, endocannabinoid system. And you'll have to excuse me, I know that people have some very strong preferences about the way to pronounce these things, but when it comes to cannabinoids and, and, and the like, I sometimes don't know which syllable to place the emphasis on. So if you'll permit me to have that little dad joke there, I'd appreciate it. But uh, so uh, I understand your strong preferences here, but I, I call them cannabinoids or cannabinoids. So phytocannabinoids uh, typically include delta THC or tetrahydrocannabinol, uh, CBD, CBN is among uh, these things, and I have a, another slide that describes describes more of these phytocannabinoids. Then there are monoterpenes and cis terpenes. And uh, most what I found in, uh, in my literature review and preparing for this uh, talk today is that a lot of the research has really been performed almost exclusively with monoterpenes. And the reason for that is that monoterpenes share a very similar chemical structure to the phytocannabinoids. So what this means is that the monoterpenes have a higher probability of interacting with the same receptors uh, in our nervous system that the phytocannabinoids do. And those, those receptors are the cannabinoid uh, one and cannabinoid two receptors. There might be possibly a third one, and these exist in our central and peripheral nervous systems. Um, many of the reasons why people use recreational cannabis is because of the activity at the cannabis uh, CB1 receptor. And these are presynaptic terminal receptors that then alter that cell's excretion of different neurotransmitters, primarily GABA and glutamate, which are the uh, sort of the major workhorses in the brain. Each one of those, GABA and glutamate, have both excitatory and inhibitory action, and I'm sure that this is probably all just a review. But um, you can see that uh, whenever I'm talking about this stuff, I have, I have my citations down there at the bottom of the slide for you. Um, and I'd be happy to share these presentation slides with anybody after, after the uh, presentation. So when I mentioned all the different phytocannabinoids, there are many. Right, it's not just THC and not just CBD. Those are the ones that we're very familiar with. But there's also cannabinol uh, or CBN, and this is a, a, a this was a paper uh, that came out in 2020. And really, these authors were speculating based upon mostly preclinical evidence in rats uh, what these different phytocannabinoids can do to a person and how they might be helpful as anti-inflammatories, uh, uh, antidepressants, uh, anti-cancer drugs, um, et cetera. But this, was, uh, this paper was speculative and again, predicated on preclinical evidence. So just like any drug, dosing really matters. It matters significantly. We think about alcohol dosing. We know what the dosing uh, needs to be within a certain particular time frame to permit us to have a drink and still allow us to drive safely. Uh, we don't really have that same kind of dosing guideline for THC, and this is something that causes me uh, some sleepless nights. But I think that adequate product labeling here can improve both consumer protection and clinical efficacy in the sense that adequate means of assessing a dose, whatever it is, um, needs to provide interpretable interpretable information to patients who are using that particular product. And we also have to expect that that interpretable information has to be based upon the variety of phytocannabinoids available, right? And uh, th those dosing guidelines should probably be diagnosis specific as they are with the treatment of other endocrine products. So uh, Dr. Nora Volkal at the uh, National Institute of Drug Abuse, uh, they put out a, an RFI or a request for information on dosing because they're looking to establish some safe ghost dosing guidelines, primarily for medical use, but also probably, probably for recreational use. Freeman and Lorenzetti, uh, they proposed uh, in a journal called Addiction, they proposed a standard unit of five milligrams, meaning that we'd have five milligram uh, increments for THC products, and this would be based upon the THC content. This is also with the presumption that THC, Delta 9 THC, is the component in cannabis that leads to beneficial effects. Okay, so th there are many assumptions here, and I just want to make that clear. The reason why five milligrams was chosen is because they felt these authors felt like it was that was a sufficiently low enough dose to minimize adverse events, meaning overdosing things like psychotomimetic effects where people become uh, psychotic while they're using uh, the drug. So data is really limited. Uh, by the lack of specific information on cannabis products, methods of administration, all of this could is something that a survey, a post-consumer survey like ours, um, like the one we would develop with you, could be helpful in achieving. Uh, 
Um, right now we have a couple of papers under review at different journals uh, describing sort of dose guidelines and what we're finding in our national survey. But in our view, this dosing issue, right, having a standard dosing unit or having a, a let's say, a therapeutic window uh, is probably the most significant obstacle to achieving product safety guidelines in regulated markets. So dosing really matters. And again, we would have to, you know, I think that the, as far as I know that these are the uh, qualifying conditions in the state of Vermont, uh, Vermont for medical cannabis. And um, it is hard to believe that we will come close to establishing clinical dosing windows for any condition when we rely on sort of the slow sequencing from preclinical testing to clinical intervention. So we need to think outside of the box, I think, and we need uh, to let consumers drive the bus, is my opinion. Um, but we can also uh, we also can't depend on anecdotal data from a small group of cannabis enthusiasts when it comes to these dosing guidelines. Um, we are so far from establishing which cannabinoids and terpenoids are effective for managing symptoms of any of these conditions that are mentioned here. Um, given that chronic pain is associated with each of these conditions, if not all of them, um, I really wanted to focus and do a cursory literature search on the use of cannabis to treat chronic pain. And that's what I'm going to present to you now. So again, this is just a cursory literature review. I've had a couple of days here um, to put something together, but pain management is something that I'm very interested in. I'll tell you why in a second. So the first thing I want to point out is that when it comes to literature review, it's completely obvious to me that there's a tremendous amount of money and conflicts of interest in any kind of cannabis publication. If you look at any publication having to do with cannabis, you'll find that the authors of that publication have conflicts of interest. They're either involved in cannabis industry somehow, uh, pharmaceutical development, or they're involved uh, in, you know, in some kind of manner that might present some conflicts of interest in the research. The other thing is that I came across significant publication biases. It was obvious to me when I was going through this uh, that uh, we have cannabis or cannabinoid specific phytotherapy journals and phytotherapy meaning like it's a bot botanical therapy journals. And they have a publication bias for any kind of cannabis publication. Meaning that if you're showing positive effects of cannabis for the treatment of any kind of condition, that the, those kinds of effects are going to be more apparent in these journals. Now, I'm not saying that that's wrong. I'm just indicating that this is a bias in favor of producing these cannabis-specific cannabis, cannabis specific, uh, publications. Then there are general pharmacology, physiology, medical journals, um, and these tend to be the journals that I've spent most of my career researching. Um, and I find that there is a negative publication bias there that oftentimes there are null effects, negative effects, and it is more rare to so find positive effects in these kinds of journals. Um, when it comes to cannabis. And confirmation bias is a thing, and you probably all know about confirmation bias. It's prevalent anywhere. And uh, what confirmation bias is, is a cognitive bias in the sense that we really pay attention to things that um, sort of coincide with our previously held beliefs. And anything that does not coincide with those beliefs, we dismiss it. We say that that is a rarity, and therefore we don't accept that information into our sort of cognitive schema of how we understand things like cannabis. And I have to tell you, to be perfectly honest, I, I wouldn't. Uh, it would be. Um, I would be a, a little bit uh, disingenuous if I didn't tell you that I had a confirmation bias that cannabis was going to be effective for pain, and that confirmation bias or, or that bias that I had really came from some early research I did where I interviewed 40 or more people who had medical conditions that they were using cannabis to treat. And these were interviews I conducted over the phone and in a true Vermont way, I did a front porch forum posting. <laughs> and I got all sorts of people to respond to that. And I had some of the most remarkable, wonderful conversations with people about how effective cannabis is and that cannabis is their medicine. And they wanted me to refer to their way, to that way as a medicine. And many of these included uh, gastrointestinal problems and you know pain management, uh, arthritis. I mean, it was just it was amazing to hear these stories of these resilient people that were using cannabis in these very favorable ways. Um, so again, this is my bias going into doing this research that of course cannabis is going to be helpful for pain. 
The other thing I came across was there's a propensity for people and even researchers to create non-falsifiable hypotheses. Now, this is something that we do that really uh, goes and coincides with confirmation bias. Oftentimes, when we don't want to believe something, we'll try to find a way and we'll do these cognitive gymnastics to try to make sure that, you know, that the evidence that we're hearing uh, can be rejected. So, for instance, this is one case of uh, non-falsifiable hypothesis, which is that uh, regarding first pass metabolism, which is what happens with a variety of different medical products that renders them less effective, our gastrointestinal system, the enzymes there destroy those uh, those products like uh, any medication taken orally, and therefore it never reaches the, the intended target, let's say in this case, the brain. We have a, a drug called Buspar, and Buspar is a drug where 95% of it is rendered in, ineffective before it reaches the brain. Uh, and that's all part of first pass metabolism. Well, these researchers said that, you know, maybe one of the reasons why they found no eff efficacy of their cannabis products was that maybe some unknown enzymes differentially influence uh, cannabinoid, cannabinoids uh, delivered orally. And what I don't like about this is that they talk about unknown enzymes. If they were to identify a particular enzyme family, like a, a cytochrome family, then that would be a falsifiable hypothesis. But using the term unknown enzymes means it, it's not falsifiable, which means that there's no way to scientifically examine it. So again, having standardized dosing thresholds and a prescriptive therapeutic window could help to improve the clinical science of cannabis by providing more falsifiability, meaning that the ability to say this dose worked, this dose didn't work. So just in terms of a, a general pain review, uh, and I'm going to talk about this, I, I hope, pretty quickly, that there's uh, you know two different types of pain. There's nociceptive pain, like having your hand on your stove and you burn it by accident. That causes you to retreat, and this is injury typical. It's typically transient, and it's a nerve response. That's one kind of pain. Another kind of, another kind of pain would be chronic pain, and this is something that I'd be more interested in, mostly because... Uh, I, like many people, suffer from neuropathic pain, and I can tell you that the general uh, treatments, uh, medications to, to deal with neuropathic pain are woefully, woefully inadequate. Some people get maybe a benefit from them. I really didn't. All I got were the side effects. So neuropathic pain is nerve damage caused by a lesion or a particular disease. Uh, we might have even chemotherapy reliably causes uh, neuropathic pain, multiple sclerosis, there's neuropathic pain associated with that. And of course, inflammation uh, re resulting from things that we've heard so much about, like cytokine storms and, um, you know, and, and COVID, and then also diabetes causing inflammation and chronic pain. So in this literature review on pain management, uh, they performed a study using uh, nociceptive pain, where they made people have pain using a, a heating element, and then they provided CBD or placebo to these individuals. And what was remarkable about this study, and this is probably the, the strong scientific evidence that uh, that previous commenter was talking about, because they were controlling dosages, they were controlling populations, it was uh, everything was well manipulated, we had the ability to establish causation. And what these researchers found is that, yeah, there was an effect of CBD, but the big effect was whether or not people were expecting that they were going to get CBD. Meaning if I'm telling you that you're getting CBD, even if you don't, the placebo effect, you're going to find a massive effect on nociceptive pain, meaning that it's going to produce analgesia. But this is a big difference because I don't think that the reason why people are taking cannabis is to help them with nociceptive pain. They're taking cannabis to help them with chronic pain, which is a different kind of pain. So this was a, a very recent uh, review, a recent article that was published, and this was more of a survey produced uh, you know, by crowdsourcing on a mobile app. And this mobile app um, was uh, allowed people to track symptom reduction in response to using cannabis. And they had data from 131,000 people um, who inhaled cannabis as a treatment. I'm sorry, this is 131 sessions, meaning that maybe it was uh, many, sometimes the same people administering cannabis. And the conclusions here was that inhaled cannabis reduces self-reported pain severity by 42 to 49%, which is huge. I mean, this is a massive reduction. 
and incredibly cons uh, you know encouraging the cannabis might be able to be effective in treating chronic pain and again this is a this is recent evidence and i think it's really interestingly technologically innovative But then I started looking for meta-analyses, and meta-analyses are statistical reviews of clinical evidence having to do with uh, cannabis and the effect on chronic pain. And two recent, uh, two recent reviews, meta-analysis, the authors of those reviews said that most of the studies on cannabis and pain management were of low quality because they failed to meet some baseline uh, characteristics of what we called randomized uh, clinical trials, which is sort of the gold standard for establishing the effectiveness of a therapy for any particular disorder. In this case, it's chronic pain. In the 2021 paper, this is their conclusion, that the evidence neither supports nor refutes claims of efficacy and safety for cannabinoids in management of pain. The second clinical, uh, this other study uh, from 2018, slightly older, found that the potential benefits of cannabis-based medicine in chronic neuropathic pain treatment might be outweighed by potential harms. So what they found is that the effects were small, but that there are side effects uh, from cannabis, like there are from any other drug, that may maybe uh, rendered those uh, the small effects to be less. Um, less important. And I, again, I just want to remind you that my bias going into this was that cannabis would be effective for pain management. When it comes to neuropathic pain, we have a variety of different uh, international societies that had have basically said no, that the evidence doesn't weigh in favor of using cannabis to treat neuropathic pain. And again, this is surprising to me, and we'll see. And you see at the top here that both the Canadian Pain Society and the Task Force, Euro, Task Force of the European Pain Federation say that cannabis should be used a third line treatment for chronic pain. Third line treatment is the same level of you know that, that you should only use opioids, for instance, to treat pain as a third line option for chronic pain. Uh, other medications are recommended, including antidepressants as being more of a first line treatment. So what they're saying here is that cannabis should be considered along the same lines of opioids and the treatment of chronic pain. And as far as I know, you know, people don't like using opioids for the treatment of chronic lasting pain because of issues having to do with toxicity and dependence. So I also, uh, James also asked me, okay, is there any sort of, in what's going on with cannabis regulation and opioid use? And uh, it, there are a couple of different studies I've found, uh, different reviews that found that, uh, you know, early on when medical cannabis laws were passed in a variety of states, there was a, a, a large reduction in opioid overdose mortality, suggesting that possibly people were, because cannabis was available for the treatment of things, that they would shift from using opioids to cannabis and this might be the reason why there might be fewer overdose uh, mortalities or overdose deaths associated with opioids so that's what we might call substitution effect right and then when medic recreational markets came along there was again a, a 11 percent reduction in opioid overdose fatalities but again we have to balance this also with what's happening in recreational markets where there it tends to be a 10 percent increase in motor vehicle fatalities so uh, from my perspective, I think that that's a zero sum game, uh, meaning that we might be reducing over opioid deaths, but we're increasing traffic fatalities. Uh, and uh, this one study, I, I really appreciate these two particular authors. Um, and uh, this study was published or this uh, review was published in the European Journal of Neuropharmacology. And they said that there is biological evidence, biological reason to think, right, that opioid, that there might be some sort of nice interactive effect with opioid systems and cannabinoid systems in the brain. And it would be really nice, for instance, if by using cannabinoids in a medical way, you can have people either not use opioids at all for pain management or use a smaller dose of opioids. That would also be huge in terms of public health generally. 
if we can give just a little bit of cannabis and therefore reduce the, the overall dose of opioids, it would uh, reduce the risk of toxicity and dependence um, quite substantially. So these preclinical animal studies definitely show a role for cannabis uh, in, in, in conjunction with opioid use. And they even found that cannabinoids can be a good treatment for opioid withdrawal, again, in rats. When it comes to human studies, though, that human studies in preclinical laboratory, meaning that when it comes to, uh, you know, no susceptive pain where humans are subjected to pain and then given cannabinoids and opioids and a combination of both, that we don't see a robust analgesic or opioid sparing effect. Again, that would be opioid sparing would be that I'm going to give you a little bit of cannabis and therefore that would make lower doses of opioids more uh, efficacious. These authors also say that uh, meta-analyses, again, do not strongly support the use of cannabinoids for chronic pain. And uh, they found modest effectiveness of uh, Delta-9 THC to suppress symptoms of opioid withdrawal. Um, but the authors of many publications have noted that this might not be the guess, best treatment for opioid withdrawal because opioid withdrawal comes with an automatic arou autonomic arousal. And I know that uh, Dr. McLean is familiar with opioid withdrawal um, in his research that uh, you know this uh, the use of cannabinoids uh, might interact poorly with that heightened auto autonomic arousal so these authors uh, do not suggest the use of op uh, of cannabinoids to treat opioid withdrawal great all right how are you doing on time I'm doing I'm doing just fine. Um, I can talk about entourage effects a little bit, uh, what they are, um, or I can just uh, proceed more to the end where I talk about drug interactions with cannabinoids and uh, maybe some recommendations um, and yeah, maybe some I mean, of these entourage effects for some other time. Well, you know, if you could, I know it's a very complex topic. You know, I think the, the goal of the entourage effect is, uh, all right, you know, if it's if it's real and there's legitimate science behind it, then we should be testing for it, testing the kind of various cannabinoids and terpenes to give patients the opportunity to try and sure. isolate uh, which which cannabinoids work for them in concert with one another. But um, if you could maybe just give a general overview and a, and a basic recommendation. Yeah, so yeah. I. I um, the, I was unable to find good clinical trials of entourage effects of either the use of terpenes by themselves, or typically we think about entourage effects as they're terpenes in combination with phytocannabinoids such as THC or CBD that enhance the effectiveness of those particular drug, those particular chemicals in the nervous system. And mostly those entourage effects would have to do with the activation and cellular response at CB1 and CB2. And it's some, it seems that a variety of studies have found that uh, these terpenes by themselves will activate those CB1 and CB2 receptors. Uh, these are preclinical studies, and that, um, but uh, that hasn't at all been sort of unanimous. And most of the good scientific stuff on entourage effects, the effects of terpenes in combination with CBD or THC, that these have been done on animals, and I have not seen anything uh, clinically um, that would let me to think, allow me to think that uh, you know this entourage effect really matters. But I'm also, I, I feel like I've got an open mind in one way that we could begin to, you know, sort of maybe break the ice a little bit on this very complicated scientific puzzle is to ask users and to see if there's any kind of agreement that let's say one particular strain of cannabis seems to be more effective at treating let's say Crohn's disease than another particular strain. But I don't see that kind of, I, I haven't seen anything to that effect. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm happy to talk about this later if time permits. Um, I found a number of different uh, studies that were super interesting, but they're incredibly scientifically controlled. They involve electrophysiology and uh, some very careful manipulations of different kinds of terpenes. The other thing I'll say is that in these cl uh, preclinical studies involving rats, they're using doses of terpenes that would be, there's no way, I don't think, that 
cannabis users, if they're using cannabis either orally or inhaled, that they're getting the uh, the dosage of terpenes hitting their uh, CB1 and CB2 receptors that are used in these animal studies. Um, gotcha. But, okay. <laughs> So, of course, you know, happy to talk about this and, you know, more if we want to. Um, but let me speed to drug interactions because I, th because I think that this is really important. Um, so this is something that was published um, by Brown, and this is somebody who's done a lot of work on sort of uh, sort of safe dosing guidelines uh, for cannabis. And uh, he talks about uh, different kinds of interactions and versus uh, uh, drug events associated with THC due to drug-drug interactions. Now, most of these negative effects, these adverse reactions that are gonna come from, uh, from interactions with cannabis and some other drug, probably have to do with the way that cannabis interferes with enzymes in the gastrointestinal system in first-pass metabolism. So it's unclear, I think at this point, how smoked cannabis, um, you know, would interfere with that 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 same uh, you know that same uh, PY450 family, um, but I think that here are some possible interactions with uh, some very fairly common drugs. Uh, the the doctors in the room, um, Dr. McLean and Antley, would probably be able to talk to you about how often warfarin is uh, still prescribed. Um, but it seems that, that there's a probable interaction there with uh, cannabis, and I think that that's important. I know that some, uh, in some cases, cannabis uh, can interfere with uh, the efficacy of antibiotics, um, but I don't think that that is necessarily a dangerous interaction. But there are some other dangerous interactions when it comes to buprenorphine, uh, when it comes to clozapine, methadone. Uh, these are drugs that I'm pretty familiar with because they ha have significant psychoactive properties. Uh, and this is something that we should probably be, be careful about. And when it comes to product labeling for medical cannabis, we might want to, you know, sort of talk about adverse reactions, inter, uh, negative drug interactions, or, um, you know, anything that would be sort of counterproductive to the ultimate goal of uh, treating somebody for cannabis, uh, treating somebody with cannabis. So uh, finally, I wanted to talk about um, improving patient access for, for cannabis. And these were some um, recommendations that the policy experts in my group made. It seems to me also um, anecdotally in talking to some friends in Vermont that having to uh, re-register every year is a little bit of a pain in the neck. Um, so that could be uh, an obstacle. Um, Lowering the application fees or waivers for patients uh, could be helpful. Um, although it's my understanding that at least some medical dispensaries will give people a $50 credit toward purchasing cannabis, you know, so maybe that there's sort of an organic response to that uh, in medical dispensaries. Uh, you can begin to add qualifying condition, uh, conditions. And then there are significant barriers to making purchase. Uh, it's my understanding that there's a 7,000 patient threshold to add any kind of new medical dispensaries. Is that true? Uh, I think that got removed when the adult use uh, came online. Okay. It's still um, $25,000 to, the, the fee is 25,000 to start a new one compared to an adult use, which is 10,000. So, um, huh. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, that sounds like it's an important obstacle to address. Um, it's also my understanding that uh, people can purchase uh, medical cannabis at an AU dispensary um, or adult use dispensary store, um, but that there are issues of patient privacy. So there has to be a separate room. Is this true? Um, I think we said in our rule, separate entrance, um, okay. which I think also maybe entails a separate room. I can't quite re recall what we wrote. If you're co-locating an adult use and medical use. Okay. Uh, you might also think about increasing purchasing, li purchasing limits for medical patients, especially to address rural demand. Um, I know that this is one of the big uh, obstacles in treating opioid dependence when I first came to the state 20 years ago, um, that how do you treat opioid dependence in people that live in the Northeast Kingdom when your facilities for methadone at the time were all in the big cities? Um, 
so uh, you know another uh, another possible solution for that rural issue is that you could have third party delivery companies involved here you could have mobile dispensaries for medical patients or you could expand sort of caregivers per patient if you can have people family members let's say purchase medical uh, cannabis uh, for their family members that have a particular condition uh, so these were just some uh, policy recommendations that uh, my group put together for you and in summary, I feel like there is inconclusive evidence that cannabis can be used effectively for pain management, um, but dosing guidelines are necessary to move uh, the clinical science forward. I think the clinical evidence or randomized uh, clinical trials uh, of terpenes in the treatment of various conditions is absent. Interactions and adverse events are definitely important considerations when it comes to labeling for cannabis products. And I think that there are also immediate and actionable ways to improve both consumer protection and clinical care. And you know, when it comes to that uh, post-consumer uh, survey that I uh, that I offered before, and then also uh, there are ways to increase patient access, as I just mentioned in the previous slide. This is really, really incredibly helpful to me, especially uh, into the. I mean, the the work that we have to do because you know it's directly responsive to the legislative requests. Um, if you're up for it, can we do maybe uh, 10 minutes of questions, no more than 10 minutes of questions? Sure. I, absolutely. I'm, I, you've got me for the two hours if you need me. <laughs> Generous. Um, so um, anyone that would like to ask questions, please raise your virtual hand. We have a very packed agenda today, unfortunately. So I'm going to have to just really um, direct this. And I'd like to start with the folks in this room. Um, because ultimately we have to make recommendations based on this information. Julie, Kyle, do you have? So I don't think I have any additional questions. I think um, you answered a lot of my questions just in your in your talking, and I really, really appreciate that. I echo. I have, a, I have a quick question as, as we kind of think about um, the future of the program. And, and first of all, thank you so much for being here. A couple of things and, and things that you hinted at um, kind of stuck with me. If we were to kind of move in a direction where medical patients can, can purchase more at adult use stores, we, we talked a lot about here with dosing and interactions with other medications. Obviously, if a medical patient's buying an adult use product, um, what kind of labeling, um, how, how can we kind of put the two together to make sure that folks understand what what kind of drug interactions might be um, something to look out for if somebody's walking into a setting that's not specific to a medical um, purchasing kind of situation. Does that, does that make sense? Oh, it absolutely makes sense. And uh, I, I think it's a great question. And I think that maybe non, uh, uh, maybe an appropriate connect, uh, parallel might be with alcohol. Um, that you don't have on any bottle of alcohol contraindications with any kind of medications. However, your medications will tell you not to drink alcohol. So if we're sell selling something in a dispensary, a medical dispensary, we want to make sure that we outline those uh, drug interactions. And maybe even alcohol can be included in those drug interactions because the two really interact poorly to promote impairment. Uh, but when it comes to things that are purchased at a recreational or adult use store, maybe we don't need to provide those contraindications or drug interactions. Um, Dr. Kirschenbaum, can I ask you a question? It sounds to me like on one of your slides when we were talking about neuropathic and infl inflammatory pain, um, you mentioned that kind of the through line between all of our qualifying conditions is the symptom of chronic pain. Um, and, you know, we have an odd sort of situation where we have kind of Crohn's disease as a qualifying condition, Ulcerative, ulcerative colitis is not, and to me, they're both kind of inflammatory pain con uh, uh, conditions. Um, and genetically related. You know, we, <laughs> yeah, so, and it's just a function of the way that we approve qualifying conditions in the state, which is, is kind of based upon advocacy and not really um, much else, you know. Um, and so I'm wondering, should we be looking, if we're thinking about adding basic qualifying conditions, should we start with the conditions that have chronic pain as a symptom, whether inflammatory or neuropathic? 
That's a hard question. That's a hard because question. Again, it, it's hard it's because. Again, it's hard because. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm getting a little bit of it. Maybe. No, that's better. Um, so uh, it, that, that's a hard question because I know that people receive a tremendous benefit uh, in chronic pain uh, from the use of cannabis products. But as I just presented, I don't feel that the empirical evidence is there to support it. Um, but ultimately, I feel like I have to be a humanist and say, hey, if you're getting a benefit from this drug and you haven't been able to get that relief anywhere else, why, who are we to get in the way? Um, but in, in terms of qualifying conditions, it's really hard for me to answer. I appreciate that. Um, so I have a list. Uh, well, can I just start, Dr. McLean? Do you have a question? I don't have a question, just a comment. Thanks, uh, Dr. Kirschenbaum, for the presentation. I think my takeaway is, you know, one of the tasks of this uh, group has been to make see if we could make specific recommendations about specific doses for specific symptoms or specific medical conditions or diagnoses and the science i don't think is there yet that's kind of my takeaway as well um so we have five people that have raised their hands. I'm going to go in order. Just keep in mind that we have about three minutes left scheduled um, for this topic. So if people can can be brief, and if it's relating to the slides that you can just kind of find the information, we will post the slides. Um, but I'm going to start just in the order that people raise their hands with Evo. And Evo, could you please be brief? I'm, I'm sorry, yourself, I'm buddy. You got to unmute yourself. OK, let me go to ask questions about slides. Uh, do, uh, do you hear me? OK, uh, so the question first about the slide about the QR code uh, and the host consumer survey. That's a great idea. But what about the people who get their cannabis, not from dispensaries, but grow out their own? or get it from friends. Uh, like I, my, my cannabis doesn't have labels and I don't have QR codes on them. It, it is drying up on my attic right now, you know, and uh, another strain is drying up on my friend's attic and we are going to uh, swap it and, uh, you know, and use a little bit of both. So that's, uh, that's one qu question. How are we going to label the cannabis products that are not bought in dispensaries and not in the little plastic bottles. Then the second question is about that slide about the driving. So how are how was data in that graphs obtained? How did you get the numbers of people in particular counties in Vermont that drove after smoking? Did you actually call people like um, and ask them, oh, do you smoke and then go driving? And, uh, you know, and what is the kind of responses uh, you got? Uh, <clears throat> then the traffic fatalities. Is the alcohol used, uh, is, is, is the result controlled for the use of alcohol? Because I think that uh, uh, most of the increase in the traffic fatalities post uh, recreational use legalization is due that uh, young people then both smoke and drink and uh, the result is uh, the increase in the in the fatalities then uh, there is also a question about the um um uh, the um uh, the, the chronic pain i mean i am prescribed uh, for chronic pain and Half of the Vermont uh, medical users are prescribed from chronic pain. And now we hear from you <laughs> that the evidence is, uh, uh, how do you say, inconclusive. 
So if it is inconclusive, why are we even using it? Why, why do we even have a prescription for pain? I mean, we are giving so many uh, chronic pain um, uh, recommendations. Hey, Evo, if you don't mind, just because we're short on time, I certainly yeah, but I, I have a little, I, I, will, I will rise a, que a question again then. Um, then, you know, I mean, I, also I think have if, to I can, if I can add, answer the questions that you've already asked. Yeah, yeah, Evo, feel free to email to any further questions. I'm sorry, Evo. Okay, so I'm sorry, Evo. You can please email Just us the, 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 rema the remaining Just questions. One more question. All right, if I can just answer those questions pretty quickly um, when it comes to the survey and people driving under the influence of cannabis, we have a particular question in our survey. Uh, how many times in the last month have you driven within tower or two hours after using your cannabis? And we get amazing responses there. We also have questions about how intoxicated can you be and still uh, drive? And those questions give us a really good indication of how many people are driving while under the influence of cannabis in a state. And we can do, and my purpose in presenting that graph and that figure was to show you that, that we can get that by county. Um, and I think it's remarkable. We even have people using cannabis before work, and we can get that by industry that they work in. Uh, so this is happening a lot. People are driving your influence and I can send you a paper Evo, uh, a great, wonderful review by some people at the National Institute of Drug Abuse that reviewed uh, all of the studies that have been case controlled studies, cohort controlled and sort of culpability controlled studies on uh, the use of cannabis and cannabis only in traffic fatalities. And I'll provide that information to you. And the best case scenario is that cannabis, if you're using it uh, at intoxicating levels, it will double your chances of getting into a fatal automobile accident. At worst case scenario, it, it that's up to eight times, eight fold increase in your ability uh, in your uh, in uh, in the likelihood that you'll have a, a traffic fatality. In response to your question about how do we get people who grow cannabis to uh, you know be involved in this post-consumer survey, is that we can't. And perhaps if there was a major benefit of legalization, is that we can provide important information at the point of sale to people that are users of cannabis to give them adequate information about dosing guidelines on THC concentration and perhaps any other chemical or contaminant that's involved in these products. So uh, thank you for those questions, and I'd be happy to answer those questions by email. Uh, you can reach yeah, out to e me. Yes. Sorry, Evo, please send the, send any further questions you have to us, and, we, and we'll get you answers. Um, next on my list is Michelle Chapman. All right, I'll make it super quick. So my main question is going to be, um, how do we plan on collecting that data with the QR codes when the majority of Vermonters are never going to be able to do that? Um, we have issues already with them being able to fill out very, very, very simple six question surveys. Um, the QR codes are going to be very hard for adults, older adults, excuse me, the elderly, because they do it, they do all of this on their computers. You can't scan them off of com um, a computer unless you have like a t you know a big tablet, something like that. Um, so I see that being very hard. I'm sure the board remembers last week when a lot of people had no Michelle, idea. Michelle, I, I think we get the I think we get the point, which is that this if we went down this path, it'd be a very imperfect sub subset of the data of all consumers, and it wouldn't capture the home growers, and it wouldn't capture people that don't have smartphones or the ability to do kind of this survey. I think we get that. Okay. Um, yeah. The other quick one is going to be the entourage effect questions in Vermont. Uh, barely anyone even offers hash rosin um, in the medical, and then barely anyone offers FICO or RSO at all. And we know FICO, RSO is polar and nonpolar, so we really need it. So I think the um, we're going to have to have that problem of figuring out how to actually get research on the entourage effect. And that is it. Yep. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. Um, Amelia? Yeah, I will also make it super quick, I promise. Um, thank you for coming to present. I thought your information was fascinating. And I just wanted to see if you could briefly touch on the difference between dependence and addiction, because I find that, and other members of the medical community find that the DSM-5 in particular, which is the current diagnostic manual, um, <clears throat> sort of took you know, the, the markers for addiction and dependence and squashed them together. And it made it a lot easier to be uh, diagnosed with substance use disorder. Because now when you look at um, the DSM-5, you can have the, um, 
you can be uh, diagnosed with two abuse symptoms or with two dependence sy symptoms, and either way, you end up with substance use disorder. Um, and once you've been diagnosed with something like that, it is very hard to get it off of your medical record, uh, especially if, and which is frustrating if you've been like misdiagnosed. So if you're diagnosed with substance use disorder um, because you got, say, longevity of use intolerance, um, and you're diagnosed because of those two things alone, even though longevity of use intolerance go hand in hand with any medication, suddenly you have, you know, substance use disorder on your medical record and that can be hard to get off. So I was just wondering if you could touch on the difference between addiction and dependence in that context. Sure. I mean, I think that unfortunately you you um, have experienced a, a negative outcome of that, but I think largely the medical community and the patient community have enjoyed a shift in the change in what we consider to be substance dependence uh, disorder um, or uh, substance use disorder to be on a continuum of severity. Uh, such that it what what it does and having the continuum of severity permits uh, insurance companies to start reimbursing or to actually reimburse treatments for it. When many years ago you couldn't get, it, I mean even with the diagnosis it was hard to get treatment for it. Um, it paid for by your insurance company. So I think that this was a, a shift that was promoted by trying to get more people to have their insurance covered for it and to also think about substance use disorder on this on this long on this big continuum such that if you're experiencing tolerance, you're experiencing withdrawal, very importantly, you've had interpersonal problems, you can't perform functions at work, um, you uh, have you know, significant, you, you've had to make significant uh, changes in your life because of your use. And also and another important one is whether or not you continue to use despite physical problems that are caused by the drug itself. Now, if you're meeting all of those criteria, then you're severely, you have severe substance use disorder versus something that might be less severe. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I think my point was just that it, it all falls under the umbrella of substance use disorder, depending on, like regardless of where you fall within that spectrum. And that can often come with things like stigmas attached, especially where cannabis is concerned. Um, but thank you for clarifying that. Sure. Thanks, Amelia. Um, uh, Dan? Hey, everybody. Yeah, I will also keep it, you know, as brief as possible because um, I know we have the comment section, but I guess I mean, it was really, you know, awful listening to that presentation. And I would just like to point out that the cannabis public policy consulting is it's a consulting firm that generally is giving testimony um, for very conservative cannabis regulations. And I guess the question is, who is funding your operation? And why go based off of research on rats when there is so much research available with with real human beings? Ari, is the like the basics of your funding sources? And, and, you know, can we find mo out more about the cannabis uh, policy, public policy uh, consulting group online? Is that? I mean, yeah, or do you, you want can. to say something? And we're we're funded by states to perform these different uh, you know, different kinds of surveys for states. We also provide uh, policy recommendations. It is not our goal of cannabis public policy consulting to promote regulation across states. We're just there to provide uh, states and uh, decision makers with information about what their residents and constituents are doing with cannabis in their states, uh, and also just nationally. I think that we can think about the uh, Substance Abuse Administration. A uh, health survey about which uh, surveys people about their substance use, but that is sort of woefully an inadequate. And we're looking at, you know, data that might be a decade old at this point. Uh, what we can get is sort of up to up to date information about different uh, groups. So we're funded, you know, primarily uh, by these states. We don't take any money from uh, any kind of lobbying group. That's not what we do. Um, there are consulting firms out there that do that, but we're really there just to provide data and information. And when I was providing information about, you know, from rats, uh, it's because the, you know, the, the rat studies are you know that they're scientific and they give some sort of under give us a basic understanding of how phytocannabinoids and terpenes might affect basic neurophysiological functioning um, and in the case of uh, something like terpenes and clinical efficacy the data just doesn't exist so you know i feel like characterizing my presentation as being focused primarily on rats i don't think that that was really a fair characterization right i characterize it as awful okay thanks dan yeah 
All right, thanks, Dan. Um, Representative Andriano. Thank you. Uh, my question will be quick. I was just wondering if you might be able to comment a little bit on the maturity of cannabis research. It was always my impression due to um, the schedule, it being a schedule one narcotic, that research was harder to do and we're only really beginning to see, we're only beginning to develop a, a foundational understanding of the of the drug. And so I was wondering if you'd be able to comment on what you see as the current status and how you see that research, excuse me, evolving um, over perhaps the next five or 10 years. Oh, it is such an exciting time to be in cannabis research, and it's one of the reasons why I left St. Michael's uh, to join this uh, public policy uh, consulting firm is because we have the opportunity to participate in one of the greatest public health experiments of all time, in my opinion. Uh, so and because of the possible rescheduling, it will be easier to do research, and I think that that is absolutely necessary. Uh, we've seen some changes uh, over the last, you know, just couple of years in our ability to do research before you had to have an investigational drug license and a DEA license in order to do any research on cannabis. And most of that research was with uh, pure THC or dronabinol um, and those kinds of uh, and synthetic drugs. So I think that we are going to see a lot more research. And you're right that perhaps it is still it has. Science has been um, impaired because of the scheduling of the substance. Uh, but I think that things are, are getting better. It doesn't mean that the science up till now has been bad. Uh, there have been some, you know, exceptional studies, but we're bound to see some more, and um, I'm I'm excited to see what what becomes of it. Thank you. And uh, Jesse Lynn, last question. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, just wanted to ask if Ari has much. Um, information from Ethan Russo regarding the entourage effect and what are your thoughts on some of that research because he is a big proponent for the entourage effect with a lot of his publications as well. Yeah, and maybe some other time I can come back to this group and talk more explicitly about the entourage effect of evidence for it and evidence against it. Um, but, you know, I think that, you know, some of the main points would be that if there is an entourage effect, it probably has to do with these terpenes and their effectiveness at the CB1 and CB2 receptor sites. And that I think that the strong research and support of it really comes from preclinical studies and electrophysiological studies. Um, at this point, I don't know um, that there is strong clinical evidence that specific terpenes and specific interactions with phytocannabinoids are really, um, you know, improve the efficacy of medications for different kinds of conditions. And if I recall, Russo is working with a researcher from Johns Hopkins to do a long, long, longer term study on the entourage effect um, and the interaction of terpenes, which hopefully will come out soon. I mean, I don't, I don't know how far along they are, but I think that that's going to be kind of a groundbreaking kind of piece of the puzzle um, on this. Um, well, thank you so much, Dr. Kirshenbaum. This has been very, very helpful to us. Um, and um, if people do have follow-up questions, please send them to that kind of ccb.med at vermont.gov and we can get um, some additional answers uh, to specific questions. Agreed. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you. So um, I did want to move on to reviewing the um, results of our patient uh, survey that we sent out. However, I do think that we're short on time. And again, we have a hard stop at 10 o'clock today because we have another um, training about kind of uh, new additions to the um, rules, the cannabis rules that were just adopted. And we have other guests um, that I've invited today. So I think we have to move on. And um, if we have time at the end, I will ask or I will review the survey results. Otherwise, we can push it to the next meeting. Um, so um, one of the um, charges of this um, working group is to find general ways to improve um, access for patients, just improve the, pro the program generally. And one thing that we've heard about from the kind of second we were first seated um, as a board was that patients um, should be allowed to use adult use retail locations um, tax free. Um, and um, I, of course, you know, the board is not opposed to any idea that benefits patients. 
Um, the issue that we have seen historically with asking the legislature to mandate this statewide is that we heard what I believe is a legitimate concern that this policy may result in one or more of the existing dispensaries closing. Um, and that, um, you know, while people may or may not like the existing dispensaries, you know, they do offer services, services and products that are not available on the adult use market. Um, things like delivery, um, high THC solid concentrates, and privacy. Um, so, you know, until there's a le legitimate plan in place to provide those services and products, I think we need to think long and hard about disrupting this kind of fragile balance that we find ourselves in. Um, but again, the very point of this working group is to explore ideas that might improve patient access, quality, and affordability. We have a group of retailers um, here today that have demonstrated a true commitment to patients over profit. Um, and they're going to help us think through how they might be part of the solution. Um, and I think we also have representative the medical dispensaries who have for years been providing critical services to Vermont's most vulnerable people, oftentimes, especially early on at great financial and personal risk. Um, you know, the legislature hasn't really updated the medical rules in a long time. Um, and I think it's a good time after we hear from the retailers to hopefully hear from the dispensaries if they've joined us to see kind of what they think some of the solutions are um, to improving patient access, quality and affordability. But let me start with the retail representatives. I think we have um, Greg Yulonski of Pine Grove Organics and Brandon. Um, I think we have Dove Sharp um, of the gas station in Rutland. Um, I think we have Eddie Fursey of Winooski Organics in Winooski, and then um, I hope we have Meredith Mann, yep, uh, from Magic Man in Essex. And if you guys could unmute yourselves, I just have um, some questions um, for you. Um, so um, I, I know that all of you have been serving patients at your adult use shops um, in various ways already, and I really appreciate that. Um, you know, our patient survey shows that people have to drive long distances in order to access the existing dispensaries and that um, oftentimes prices are just unaffordable. Um, and I know you guys have been filling that gap. Um, so um, in thinking about kind of this merger of adult use and medical, um, to me, the most critical functions of the medical program are access to specialty products first. I'll start there. Um, you know. These include products that you wouldn't typically stock on your shelves because they're either prohibited, like the high THC solid concentrates, um, or because there's not a real demand amongst adult use consumers. Um, mm -hmm. Things like, you know, maybe FICO um, or transdermal patches or so, some other kind of uh, specialty product. Um, if we required, uh, the CCB required that you have a plan in place to supply specialty products to patients that needed them, not necessarily immediately, um, but maybe in a reasonable amount of time. Are you guys, do you have a plan for meeting those? I mean, you know, let's just take FICO or, or high THC solid concentrates. I mean, how would you go about ensuring that patients can have continued access to those products? And I don't, I know there's, I think four or five of you, if you don't mind just kind of self-monitoring how to, how to respond. I, I don't know how to call on you individually, but if anyone has thoughts on that. Meredith? I mean, for me, the first thing I think of is um, manufacturing and access for us to get those products. So um, there would, we would either need to work with the existing medical dispensaries or there would have to be some kind of um, licensing um, change for some manufacturers to be able to produce those products for us. Mm -hmm. That would be. Do you have those? Do you have those relationships with manufacturers? And I mean, would it be? Yes, absolutely. Price? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is another concern um, because a lot of FICO and, or RSO can come in a plastic syringe in general. Currently under uh, our manufacturer for rec recreational packaging laws, a lot of that would not be able to um, be on market on our shelves in retail. Too quick. Two quick points. Packaging, that's something, of course, you know, um, we can figure out. Meredith, to your point, from a manufacturing perspective, the way that things 
technically operate from a legality perspective is it's not necessarily illegal to manufacture those products. They're illegal at the right. point of retail sale. So I don't think necessarily anything would have to change in our regulations in order to allow those relationships with manufacturers um, to be able to produce those products. It's a different conversation if a manufacturer would be willing to make those products, recognizing, you know, it, this is a patient's over process, over profits kind of, um, you know, characterization that we're that we're putting this in. And my follow up question is, obviously, we're still in this. If we smush these together, and that's a you know, apologies for that kind of <laughs> really basic phrasing. The elephant in the room is obviously these pro some of these products are still illegal to adult use, um, you know, buyers, right? And I don't want to put any of your employees in a position where they accidentally sell one of these products through miscommunication or misunderstanding to somebody Absolutely. who's asking for one. So, what kind of training? or plans would you want to see from us to make sure that we don't put you in a in a situation that could you know come back to, to hurt everybody greg do you want to start sure yeah uh there are definitely like med only tags in all of our point of sale systems that we can put on products so that they are not sold to the public no matter what um obviously uh, a, a physical hand to hand error is still possible, but I think um, in, in tandem with like robust medical training and those tags, we wouldn't have many issues, if any. Thank you. And Dove? Um, same for me. I know that personally for POS systems that I've used in state and out of state with both med and rec dispensaries, uh, Flow Hub, Dutchy, as well as BioTrack and some other major ones, all of that is very capable to be tracked in those POSs in two ways. One way is through collect, correct uh, customer grouping and cataloging where specific products cannot be rung up under a recreational customer. Another way to do it is with a separate medical license where you have a location based separate POS that can run as a regular register, um, but that is going to only have a medical catalog in it and only be checked in through medical customers. So there's really kind of a twofold system. I think tracking uh, on the state level is essential in our in uh, getting that medical program into adult use stores. Um, a traceability needs to be key and paramount in this. Yeah, it's kind of I like agree how with Go ahead, Mary. Yeah, I just wanted to, I agree with all of that and really wanted to stress the importance of the tracking and internal compliance of that, um, you know, uh, and keeping it separate. And anybody who uh, is running a dispensary uh, should understand that. And it should be um, a non-issue with Dutchy systems and being able to keep products separate um, and, yeah, I don't really uh, think that in a um, in a rec dispensary right now, people who are running one should have a problem being able to track and separate. Absolutely. Um, yeah, to Kyle, can well, anyone... to Kyle's first point. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. This this is Eddie. Can you can you guys hear me? Oh, Eddie. Yes. Um, cool. Um, yeah, I would I would just wanted to comment on the um, you know. Get, uh, receiving the product, getting the product, you know, right now we're doing some of this already where we're working with certain manufacturers to create FICO and donate it to the patients. Um, and, you know, I think that it would be something similar that we could adopt into this program um, as well. Um, I think it's doable for all of us to put in special orders for that, for those type of concentrates, you know, um, I also wanted to comment on the, the high THC concentrates. Um, you know, I'm not sure how much of that is really um, a, a medical product. You know, I think the more full spectrum stuff that's legal on the rec market is is more beneficial to these me medical patients. Um, at least we've seen that anecdotally. Um, so, you know, it's hard to say how many patients would actually need the high uh, THC concentrates. Um, and, you know, I think the FICO, um, has been, has proven to be more, more effective and that falls within the legal boundaries of the rec market. It's just, um, 
you know, it's obviously not produced because not many people use it in the rec market. It's more, more medicinal. Um, so, you know, working with, with the, with the manufacturers to create those type of products is definitely doable. Um, as long as, you know, there's some benefits to, to those manufacturers for doing it. A lot of, a lot of them are doing it, you know, out of pocket right now. And, you know, we're taking, we're, we're, you know, taking it on the hip up for a lot of things as well right now, just to support the medical program. So it's definitely doable. That's my comments on it. Thanks. Yeah, that was kind of at the economies of scale. They don't exist for FICO, you know, and so I, I wonder if manufacturers would be willing to even kind of shut down their production on their edibles just to make FICO for a handful of patients that might you know, be within kind of 20 miles of their stores. But it sounds like, you know, with the right notice and the right relationships, it could, it is possible. Yeah. And I think, and I think just compounding my point, I think, I think my point was if we would have had the time to go through our patient survey and we will do that at some point, you'll see that there are patients out there utilizing these products that, you know, Eddie qualitatively thinks perhaps they're not as present in the medical market as, as he's experienced with work, with his conversations with, medical patients. And if we move in this direction, I wouldn't want any patient to feel as if their preferred, you know, vehicle or cannabis product wouldn't be available to them unless they drove halfway across the state to find it. And that's one of the problems that I think we're trying to, to fix here. So thank you. Um, so access to, um, I mean, another one of the key functions in the medical program is that someone on staff with special knowledge about cannabis for symptom relief, has the ability to spend one-on-one -on -one time with a new patient or maybe um, a low cannabis information patient um, to help them determine what sort of products could potentially help their specific needs. If cost were no option, um, how would you plan on being able to provide this one-on-one -on -one consultation? I know a lot of you work with Jesse Lynn already. Um, and so I think that's, I, I, I know that that option exists. Um, are, are there other things that you would want to do um, if, if, you know, if the state was subsidizing the cost of education or something along those lines? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, just after listening uh, before, education is key for both the bud tender and the consumer. So um, making sure that we have a, um, you know, a, and understanding that scope of practice. And if a dispensary is providing medical services um, that we do not have people who aren't trained and don't understand answering questions. Um, I think um, Jesse Lynn is an extremely important resource and all of us should use her um, unfortunately, there's only one Jesse Lynn. I wish we could duplicate her, but um, I do think it's something we can all do on our own with the maybe uh, proper training and certificate or a certain amount of time with a medical background um, would be a good idea, something that makes consumers feel more confident in that. And I think you know, at least I know at our dispensary, we have quite a few people who have that medical background. So I think medical patients and that background can really help to validate that. And I think we could probably all work together to develop some kind of simple certification that would give that level of confidence. I agree. I think it comes down to extensive training. Uh, I would feel more comfortable with having every person on that staff, if you're making medical sales, be trained in some sort of uh, add-on course to our already authorized bud tender training, um, because I believe that any medical patient should be able to come in and have that experience. I think for ways of offering consultations, it does get a little more granular with store specifics, whether they have space for separate rooms or whether that looks like a Zoom call or specialty hours, I think can be also very effective um, where they can have a pre the store privately to themselves, um, whether that's through scheduling or on a walk-in basis can be a little more individual. Uh, right now, we have several customers, for example, at my own store who are immune compromised who are medical patients who shop with us uh, they call ahead and I actually clear the store for them and I have never had an issue with recreational customers waiting to have that uh, personal and private experience whether it's a pickup order or a full uh, console and sale at that time um, I know that any retailer on, uh, in this meeting right now would be willing to make those exact same um, 
I don't want to say exceptions, uh, but uh, add ons to their services for these patients right now. And I think for each retailer that might look a little bit different, but having that written out plan approved by the CCB of what that looks like for that particular store uh, could be very effective and important for us. So, yeah, I mean, my of course, my follow up question, which is very closely related, which is patient privacy is a very critical aspect to um, the medical program for a variety of reasons. The stigma is still there. Certain certain professions, you know, it's even amplified. Um, do, does everyone on the call, uh, the, the kind of four retailers feel like at your store you could accommodate patient privacy? To some degree, and it doesn't have to be kind of separate entrance, separate shop. You know, I'm ta I'm talking. You know, just like you said, either specialty hours of operation or curbside delivery, delivery in general potentially. Um, does everyone feel that there's some way where you could accommodate patient privacy if that was a concern? Absolutely. I think absolutely. Um, I think a combination of all of those things: some separate hours, curbside, Zoom consultations. Um, but uh, also just, I think uh, she, uh, Dove is right. Every store is different, has a different setup, may have different POS or different amounts of POS systems. Um, for us, we have five, so I could take one and just isolate that area, put up a partition on a certain day or all days, depending on how this goes. If it became law, maybe I'd put sheetrock up. It sort of depends on how this goes to make sure patients get that comfort zone they're looking for. Um, and I do think a lot of people are looking for that. Medical patients are looking for that privacy and for um, the education from a bud tender. A lot of them really do know what they need and want to just come in, get what they want and go um, as quick as possible for either their health issues or whatever as well. So finding a balance with that. Um, we don't have, sorry, we don't have a lot of tools at our disposal. I mean, what, what we're asking, what we would be asking you to do is to take on additional responsibilities in order to serve patients. Yeah. We don't have a lot of tools at our disposal to kind of compensate you or, or incentivize you to do this. Um, but just, you know, there's obviously fees that we can kind of work around. Everything we do would have to be approved by the legislature, but um, from either a regulatory standpoint or a statutory standpoint or a financial standpoint, are there things that you would that would help you you and other retailers um, kind of take on these added responsibilities? Greg, did you want to yeah. start? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think offering tax-free sales to patients is the biggest thing you can do um, easily. Like, it's it's not close. I think that's the first thing that will help the positive snowball effect um, of getting more patients. I think we we discussed in a in a meeting prior about access to renewals and the ability to get a card. I think that's a big issue in the state um, that needs to be addressed kind of outside of this discussion. Um, but yeah, I think the twenty one percent or at least the 14 percent excise being waived for all medical patients at adult use would be a massive step in the right direction i don't think us as retailers want anything in return for that honestly like i think it would be the quality of care increase that we would be able to provide um, would be enough for us to not only you know show medical patients that we can do an awesome job of taking care of them but um yeah just be able to offer tax-free and and more affordable medicine. Yeah, I, I would Sorry. echo that as well. Um, I think that um, if we provided, you know, state funded training to um, up the knowledge of the bud tenders to to be able to give consultations like Jesse Lynn has been giving for our patients right now, um, you know, we send patients to her every week to to get on a phone call with her and just run through symptoms and medical and medicine and all the things that they would need to talk about um, if that type of training from from her from someone else came to our bud tenders um, maybe subsidized by the state or just by the influx of more medical patients um, which I think, you know, striking the tax would, you'd see a large influx of people trying to get their 
their cards back because I know I talked to customers today or uh, this week and they're saying that's one of the main reasons they still try to go to the to the medical stores is because of the the taxes are, are lower um so it becomes a cheaper product even even with us giving 21 percent off they still have to pay 21 tax on top of that so it's really like they're just getting the msrp price where if you know they weren't paying tax and they were getting a discount in their shops you know they'd be paying um much more fair value so yeah i think you know benefit to the retailer for for trying to take this on would just making sure that their staff is trained properly to talk with these with these uh, patients. Great. And I'd Dope. love to add that if staff was trained to give an initial consultation with a medical patient and had formal training with all due respect I believe we'd be a we'd have a better program because I don't believe any bud tenders need any training to do any of the consultations at, at the medical level, having been a person who gave those consultations many years ago. So I think this is already making this a better program, my personal opinion. Thanks, Meredith. Oh, did you want to add? Yeah, just to uh, echo Eddie, I think the biggest importance would be help in educating. Um, I don't need a kickback from the state and I don't need discounts to help people who deserve this medicine more than anybody. Um, and I don't want it to feel like it's some sort of financial reward to help a medical patient because it should strictly be about fairness, access, and keeping people comfortable who are going through really debilitating issues. Um, education is really where that starts and finishes for me. Any support that I could do to educate my staff better from the state level would be taken with so much pride. Um, I know for all of my staff members, they would be eager, eager. Uh, to get this information from Jesse Lynn or however we feel is best for them. Um, the second thing is, is uh, this would be putting our state so far ahead of other markets that I have worked in, whether it medical or recreational dispensary, there's, there are so few trainings available countrywide uh, to get these badges and to have these licenses. Um, I think it would really set the Vermont market apart. I think you will see more med card renewals and new patients seeking their med card out through this programs. Um, and I know there's a big concern about losing that $100,000 in medical licensing fees. Um, I think removing that 14%, even if we did still have to have the 7%, I think you would find that income is made up through our recreational tax dollars. And I think we all as recreational uh, dispensaries have that data already in our system that we would have already made that money back. Um, so I think as a financial tool, that is very important to look at. Um, I know we don't have that data from our medical dispensaries right now. We do in our recreational, and I think it's very important it's looked at. This has been really helpful for us, and I and I really do want to extend my gratitude for what you guys are all doing already. I mean, I, mean, I know when you, when you guys give a patient a discount, um, you guys are that's coming out of your bottom line and you're doing it because like you said that you feel it's important um so really appreciate it this conversation um will be ongoing i feel like uh you know we'll see kind of how it looks in our recommendations at the next meeting and, and you know you guys can comment on it then um i do just in the sake of time have to move on and i apologize but um i noticed that we do have some representatives from the dispensaries here um I would like to underscore that these dispensaries um, have been providing a critical service to Vermont um, for at least 10 years now. Um, you know, I appreciate your dedication and service to the patients in the state. Um, the statutory framework that you are existing under has made economies of scale and the cost of doing business very challenging to navigate. Um, and yet, you know, we, if you look at our patient survey, a lot of patients have a very positive experience with the dispensaries. So, um, I don't, you know, I'm just wondering if Virginia or if John or Lee or anyone um, from the dispensaries would like to kind of weigh in as to what they feel like in their experience has been the most challenging aspects of the, the statutory framework and what they would need um, in order to be successful or improve access, equality, and affordability.
Hi, this is Lee Stoll from Grassroots. Um, and as the, you know, the newest member of the medical side, because I just purchased from the MSO, um, I think there's a number of things that are um, not taken in consideration here. Number one, we sell wholesale flour to um, dispensaries now, and we sell to our medical patients at a much lower price than any of the current um, people who buy our products. So our products go out to our to our patients at a lower price, and that's not even including the the tax. We deliver to the entire state from corner to corner. It is a massive loss to our company to do it, but we do it because there are many homebound patients, and um, and our our integrated license is not the license that is, that we pay for for medical. We pay an additional twenty five thousand on top of it in order to serve this patient group. Um, if we 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 buy if there are manufacturers out there that sell products that are only for medical i'm unaware of them other than the other medical people so you know if there is someone out there that's you know struggling to sell to medical patients um they're not reaching out to one of the three um we buy products that we, that we lose money on because and 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 make because we See this as a service that we're providing, and it's and we're trying to do it not because we're making money on it, but because it's a service. We, you know, we spend an enormous amount of time educating our staff on uh, and spending considerable time with patients who would, not, were we not around, would not have the products delivered to their houses would not have the products at the discount that we sell them to. And, um, and we're losing money on it. So um, I'm not, I, I, I appreciate that the access issue is an issue, but I think the, that the, the, that it is hard to comprehend from the recreational side that there are so many other ancillary products and services that we give that cost a significant amount of money, not the least of which we pay much more to have our door open than what you have to open your door. And so, I mean, I, I'm, I'm also opening a recreational dispensary, but I am, but I really want to keep the medical side going. And I just, I would say to you that the credibility in other markets outside of the state are dependent on there being a robust medical program that is independent of the rec. And the reason that the medic that the medical um, services here are are necessary are because there are things that you that you will lose money on if we don't do if you don't do it. And so, you know, like delivery. I have, you know, my dispensary guy goes from my my delivery guy goes from Brattleboro all the way to the top of the state, and we charge. I think our maximum charge is fifteen dollars or twenty dollars to deliver, and we don't we don't we we deliver at whatever price point that they need to be. You know, if I'm selling a sixty dollar item, and I'm going up to the you know <coughs> the, the, the the Northeast Kingdom, there is no profit in it. Plus, we sell it cheaper than you guys do. So I just, I would, I would, I'm the new guy on the block. I'm not the person, I mean, we're not, we're not an MSO. We are a, we are all Vermonters who, who run this. So this is not big money coming in trying to control the medical. This is small business, just like you are trying to keep this business alive. That is not cost effective. So just my two cents. No, hey, thank you, Lee. Can, Lee, can I ask you a quick question? How I understand that you you know do delivery end to end in the state. How frequently do is that needed? Is it something that happens every day? Is it something that happens every week? How frequently okay. is delivery access? I have a full time driver, and he drives probably uh, three or four days a week. 
Um, and, and, you know, there's, there's products that are sold to a very, very small number of patients that have to be made that candidly, there's, you know, they're like, they're not a, they're not a moneymaker. So, um, but yeah, my delivery is absolutely a cost is, is I do it at a loss because I serve the patients. Thank you. Lee, how, um. How do your delivery sales, and you don't have to get into anything that's proprietary, but compared to your in-person um, sales and branding? We do more delivery than we do um, in, uh, well, yeah, it's close, it's close. It's close, okay. And, and is insurance a major cost for your delivery driver? Insurance, gas, hours, and we and again we haven't really raised our prices because our patients need it at a lower price and you know we're selling you know eighths at a significant discount to what retail is selling so it's not just the 20% that our patients save it is it is also a it we sell our flour at a lower price so you know these are all considerations that i mean if we can't afford it that could go away so uh, we're all, we're we're doing it as a service to the state, and if we're taking you know patients away, it it would be it would be a, a disappointment that the state would lose um, people who are dedicated to doing just this. Lee, one one final question on on the delivery bit, um, and thank you for that service. Do you and again, if we're wandering into proprietary or or you know, medical information, certainly feel free to um, decline to answer and maybe we can talk in a different setting. But from a delivery perspective, you say that about half of your patients are utilizing that service. Do you have any kind of uh, inkling on whether or not half th that that cohort of patients require that service versus it being a convenience given the, the, the small number of medical dispensaries and where they are located in the state? Um, good question. I, it's not proprietary, but I would say that, I, I mean, we have a, we have a decent number of homebound or handicapped. We have a decent number. We, we also have people who, because, you know, we sell that the price that we do and we're further away, they are, you know, they, they use it as a, I, I don't know that the word convenience is the right word, but, um, yeah, it's I mean, it's it's a very necessary service and it is not a moneymaker. So. Losing that would be a big loss to the state for medical. Patients. I know, and I'm sorry, maybe convenience was the right word. I guess maybe, you know, it it's an option for some. It's not an option for others, I guess, is what I was getting at. So thank you. Fair enough. I, I and I wasn't taking it as any other way. And, and you know, I, I'm just I'm just saying that these are the co the hidden costs along with the $25,000 that we pay to have a medical dispensary that I am telling you doesn't make enough money to cover $25,000 um, is, is a necessary um, understanding that there are, there are far more hidden costs than just where, you know, the, the patient gets to save the 20%. Yeah. Um, if that 25,000, you know, fee was not, if that was reduced, you know, and I, I, I don't have any control over that, but if it was reduced to zero because you're providing a service, um, to patients that need it, would that help your profitability? I know like it's, a, you know, obviously it's 25,000. I mean, it's just, it's an amount of money, <laughs> but, but would that, would that like cover your delivery costs? Um, our deliver. I mean, every time we deliver, it's a cost that is not recoupable. But again, yeah. we do it because the service provided to the people in the state that need this is we consider it to be a necessary service to the state. Yeah. And and we spend an enormous amount of time with just one person in our dispensary because we give them that space. That you know there is a there is a waiting room where people day that we don't allow more than one person in the room at a time. Yep. 
Any other questions for Lee in Virginia? Or, I'm going to get to everyone's questions. I'm just going to wait until we've heard from, you know, whatever the um, kind of representatives from the dispensaries want to say. So, um, Virginia, is there anything or anyone else um, from the dispensary side that would like to kind of speak about the hardships that they're facing and what we can do either in this report or just regulatory wise to, to support you? Yeah, and I think um, I see that Russ has his hand up, um, and so I would s suggest that you, you know, I know you have limited time here, um, so I, I would like to, uh, you know, it'd be good if you all heard from him as well. Um, you know, I think that, you know, as you know, and I've said over the years that the biggest issue for this medical program has been the lack of healthcare pr providers. Uh, recognizing the importance of cannabis to relieve people's symptoms. Um, and, and that's been an, a battle that we have been having since, I've been having since 2000. So, um, you know, and I don't know how we change that. Um, I do think that it would be, um, you know, one of the things is medical dispensaries are not allowed to advertise, same with adult use, but, um, Having this program talked about more by the Cannabis Control Board, uh, the support of the Cannabis Control Board of the medical program and being able to, you know, let Vermonters know that it's out there um, because the lack of advertising has definitely uh, hindered that. And I do think, you know, I appreciate the fact that uh, some patients now can register for three years and they don't have to pay that $50 fee. I think it would be important to try to reduce that fee um, for, uh, for all patients, bring it down to, you know, cut it in half. I mean, it'd be great if they didn't have to pay anything, but um, I think, you know, obviously you have to have money to run your program. I also think that the $25,000 uh, for medical dispensaries, you know, if somebody else wanted to open a medical dispensary, why would they when they can open a retail store for 10,000, but a medical program is paying 25,000. And I just think that that fee is, um, it's never changed. It's been there since the law was first put in um, for the medical dispensaries. Um, I think that would be a, a plus. To have that. Yeah. And yeah. I also think that, you know, five or six years ago, the Senate, who's always been very supportive of the medical program, you know, they passed a bill that allowed doctors to be, or healthcare professionals to be the ones to make the decision if you should be allowed to, uh, you know, use it as, um, as a condition. And, um, you know, the House did not pass that. But I go back to that, you know, I can go to my doctor and um, he or she might decide that, you know, something's going to be good for me, even though it's not really for my condition uh, off, you know, and, um, and we're not allowing that with cannabis. And, you know, I appreciate the presentation that was done earlier, but I think that, um, you know, when the studies are coming back saying that, you know, cannabis doesn't really help with chronic pain. Um, I think that, you know, studies have to be happen, happening with the individuals out there who are using this. And I can tell you for the years that I've been working on this issue, patients definitely have a huge benefit from cannabis for their chronic pain. Um, and, you know, but we need to do more research into that. And I think that in this country, we're very limited on that. So, but um, yeah, hopefully you have time to hear from Russ. Thank you. Yes, we do. And, uh, you know, the the other folks have started the other meeting. So, uh, you know, and um, Dr. McLean, I know if you need to drop off, we only scheduled you this meeting for two hours. It, it's, it, it's totally fine. Um, and if anyone else needs to drop, I understand. But Russ, I see your hand raised. Would you mind joining in? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, thanks. So I, I would want to echo some of the things that Lee um, in Virginia said I to, to your to your question on how we can make the, the program easier with what like, with the power that the CCB can do obviously you know, in my opinion is ha obviously having more qualifying conditions making it um, easier to get a card may not be something you have the ability um, 
to to do today. I, I would say to make it easier, um, just making it easier for patients who do qualify to get cards, um, expediting that to the degree that is is possible. Um, you know, getting we we've had a lot of delays in people um, that want to be on the program and want to renew their program getting cards. So just access the cards and to Virginia's point, just highlighting the program for the general public and making folks more aware of what the, the, the benefits may be for those folks that um, could really benefit from using cannabis, I think could go um, a long way. Um, and you know, the, the, the fees for you know, eliminating or reducing the fees dramatically for these patients to get their cards um, and also just allowing folks to receive notifications in advance if they do need to renew, um, you know, a lot of times those will lapse and it takes a long time for those folks to get their cards. And we've had a lot of patients that have gone extended times waiting for a card renewal that aren't able to get the medicine that they're, that they're looking for. So just making it more obvious, easier, and cheaper for patients to get on the rolls, I think is important. Um, we, we all know that the medical program rolls are declining. Um, they've, been declining dramatically since adult use has come up and it, and it makes sense. Um, there are a lot of reasons that folks have been on the program in the past. Um, some really appreciate the specific experience um, that they get from the medical dispensaries. Um, the environment's much different from a typical adult use dispensary, obviously ours certainly is. Um, and people like the, the privacy, the attention and the experience. There are others that were um, on the program in the past because they had, they wanted access to cannabis and now that can be fulfilled through an adult use dispensary or something more convenient for them. Um, I would say if I was a, an owner of a dispensary um, for adult use, I'd certainly be advocating to, um, to treat these patients and to be able to take these patients on and provide the same services. Um, I know like, for example, like there's no one in the state that I know um, that cares more about um, patients and appreciates cannabis as medicine than like Meredith, for instance. So I totally understand that. My, um, I'd say my thought on it is just one of scale. Um, we, because we have a concentrated patient base, um, we're able to, you know, produce these products and do it with some efficiency and do it with a pretty narrow supply chain that makes that access viable, not only for our dispensaries, but for the other medical locations. And we would certainly see a decline in patients um, that would take advantage of going to other places. I'm not, I mean, it's just part of that. I, I totally understand it because there's a percentage that would go somewhere else if it was more convenient. Um, and so my concern is that those products will, you know, we wouldn't be able to continue to make those products or other people wouldn't be able to make them just because of the the volume. And so my hope is that if we collectively focus on just trying to increase the roles, this makes it more viable generally. Um, that if we've got more people on the program, there's more incentive for folks to get a medical license. There's a big reason why people aren't doing it now because it's not profitable. Um, and it probably wouldn't be profitable at a $5,000 um, you know, um, cost. It's just, you know, it's not something people are doing now because adult use makes more sense for them. So um, my, that's kind of just my thoughts overall that um, if we move to this, the viability of the medical locations goes down and then the viability of the product production um, may not exist. And just something that we need to consider as we continue to have a declining, um, you know, kind of patient base. Yeah, really, I, I really appreciate that insight. Um, and that is the kind of the challenge that we're facing here is that the, you know, the the patients that are using the program, and if I went through the survey, like it, but there are significant challenges to access that they're facing. And um, um, it's this whole just, and we make sure that they're held harmless. And, they, and maybe the answer is, it, we can't, uh, and we just need to kind of rethink um, what we're doing and, and make sure that we put patients first. Um, 
and there's going to be a transition or we just try and find a way forward kind of that merges what we have and what was developed on the adult use side and i think i think we're we're, we're starting to get i i see i see i'm starting to see a little bit of a path forward but it's not something that i want to do uh to the detriment of the patients you know um so um Anyone else from the medical dispensaries that would like to weigh in um, before we turn to public comment? No, OK, so um, just as far as next steps, um, just want to say briefly, I intend to hold the fourth meeting. I'm aiming for the week, the first full week of December. So the one that starts on the fourth, I'm, I'm it sounds to me there's one more witness, expert witness I'd like to bring in. She's available on the 7th, so I'm, I'm thinking it might be the 7th of December, but still have to just kind of tie up a few loose ends um, before we schedule that. Um, and if anyone who's watching um, and wasn't able to kind of provide feedback, you can email the board about these meetings and about recommendations for this report to ccb.med, ccb.med at vermont.gov. And um, I think at the next meeting, it's my hope that we can hear from just a few more experts and then also review the draft recommendations. And my hope is to just publish those before that meeting so that people can have an opportunity to dig in and, and provide meaningful comment at that meeting. Um, so, um, with that, I'm just going to turn to public comment. And again, this other meeting is on, is going on without us. So, um, you know, we have time to stay, but Julie or Kyle, if you need to go, feel free. Um, and I have kind of a basic order. Um, and I'm just going to start with the way that you raise your hands. Um, start with Michelle Chapman. Hello. OK, I just wanted to comment that we will be able to provide FICO to all dispensaries that want to be able to do it along with suppositories we have three machines to do it i would just need to go ahead and buy the safe room which realistically wouldn't take that long to get here um we are good to go ready to push it out as soon as we are told we can thanks for that michelle um jesse lynn hi thank you so much for having public comment um, quickly, I just wanted to see if it's possible for the medical dispensaries to give you guys data and information about how many people are using higher potency specialty products and delivery. I think that would really help understand what retail uh, adult use retailers need. As far as education, I do want to just mention that the education I give is a minimum of 12 hours with continuing education. And I think Continuing education is a huge piece of this. Educating somebody once a year, every two years, isn't necessarily enough. And recognizing that a lot of our bud tenders are educated with a two hour online program that they're only paying 20 bucks for comparatively. But when we think about financial, the financial piece of it, I really appreciate and love all the retailers that spoke today for saying that they don't want or need any financial kickback, but they are taking the burden of this. So I just want to put out there that the retailers I'm working with are paying much more for education, are also sponsoring and paying the hotline. So they really are financially taking a burden. So I just want to as much as they said they don't need anything i just want to put that out there on the radar that i would really like to see some financial support for them as well and recognizing that 30 percent of the taxes from excise are specific for prevention if we could have longer conversations about how we need that to also be allotted for harm reduction because education is harm reduction and then transparency around how we're how that 30 percent excise money is being allotted and given out and who has some of the say around that and then lastly just recognizing that there's not medical professionals in the medical program so we need a medical professional either for them to have a referral to to have that support person behind them so the bud tenders do feel supported um, when things are overwhelming, when they list 13 medications and chemo and other things like that. Um, and then lastly, a couple of people at the medical dispensary spoke about um, needing more advertising, and I couldn't agree more. I think the Vermont Department of Health pamphlet is a great example of education they're putting out that isn't quite up to date. When you look at the vaping section, and they talk about vaping oils, they don't even mention vaping uh, flour. So we really need to make sure 
the Vermont Department of Health is also on the same page and putting out the education that we need. And their website at the Vermont Department of Health links cannabis and opioids as the same. It doesn't ever talk about the medicinal use of cannabis. So I couldn't agree more with the medical dispensaries that we really need for more of a public statement around medicinal use. And that, of course, comes with responsible use and education. Um, so thank you so much for uh, having us comment today. I tried to go fast. <laughs> no, that's great. <laughs> um uh dan hey everybody yeah i will try to be brief because i know these meetings go long but uh yeah when you guys announced that you were having these these meetings to kind of redevelop the medical program you know i asked if i could participate because uh i started a medical collective in 2011 on the west coast and um you know really seeing the medical community i partnered with larger collective groups and was serving over 250,000 patients and so it's true that a lot of those patients just want to smoke weed and get high, but the most gratifying and enriching part of the whole experience was truly helping people that are actually sick, that depend on cannabis for medicine. And so I hope that by participating in these meetings, you guys would maybe consider some of my opinions very strongly in, in how you do this, because there's a lot of people um, that do need access to medical cannabis. And I'm really concerned that you guys are going to make it over-regulated and harder for people to get access to. The, the presentation today, I know I criticized that guy and I was rude to him and I did it kind of to be funny, but I mean, the truth is he's a lobbyist that is paid by conservative organizations that are concerned about addiction and trying to create very stringent policy. Um, and I don't think that's what Vermont needs. And I don't think that sounds very much like Vermont. There are a ton of studies that are done on actual human beings that really oppose everything that he's talking about. And I mean, I'm not a scientist, so I can't say, oh, just because, it, you know, sometimes I get busy and I don't smoke cannabis for a few days or every once in a while I take a tolerance break and don't smoke for a couple of weeks. I understand that science proves in order to prove you're not an addict, you need to not smoke or consume cannabis for six weeks. It's like saying that 11% of people who consume cannabis are, are addicts is, is offensive. And um, I think there's a lot of information out there in science that can completely debunk almost everything that he said. And I, I find it a huge waste of time. We have this really important discussion and spent over an hour um, listening to that rhetoric. And I was just gonna say that I would really love the CCB in the state to consider if a person thinks that ingesting cannabis into their body and their system is gonna improve their quality of life as a medicine, then that person should be entitled to have that decision. It should just be as simple that if any physician believes that a patient could benefit from cannabis medicinally, that physician should be able to make that recommendation for the patient. I have no say in this about business. It's not about business or making money or fighting about you know, who's adult use. I'm just talking about for patients, for individual human beings, if cannabis can enrich the quality of their lives and they believe that it does so in a medicinal way and their doctor agrees, there should be no restrictions on that. And that is my recommendation that I would really love for you guys to consider. And uh, about the driving thing too, I mean, you know, there's plenty of studies out there that say that cannabis actually makes people safer drivers. I'm not a scientist, I can't quote those studies, but that was just so ridiculous. Look, at the last time that guy spoke was before the, the state of Indiana, one of the most conservative states where people can still go to prison for over 20 years for, for distributing not that much cannabis. And the whole intention of him testifying in Indiana is to scare their regulators into thinking that their children are going to become drug addicts and people are going to have fatal automobile accidents. So anyway, that's that's my comment. Thank you for the time. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, Andy? Uh, thank you. C can you hear me? Sometimes I have trouble with Microsoft. Great. We're good. Uh, yes. So we are down to the roots in Chester. Um, like others, we're an adult use dispensary that believes serving the health and wellness of our community is first and foremost. Um, so from the start, we actually built a private consultation room and we're now having in-person hours with Jesse Lynn at our dispensary. And I can't recommend that enough. Um, like others, we sponsor Jesse Lynn. We'd like to see the entire adult use community sponsoring Jesse Lynn. Um, we also discount medical card holders so that we're eating the tax, the adult use tax instead of them. Um, so we could do more to serve that community if the adult use tax were waived for medical card holders. And if the, help, if the state helps subsidize 
the cost of Jesse Lynn and those like her that offer these incredibly important services. Um, we could also do delivery so that Lee and others don't have to serve the entire state, which by the way is very much appreciated, but it is not fair that the burden is on just the medical uh, dispensaries and it's not fair to them to pay $25,000 when we're paying $10,000. Um, and then last, whatever products are allowed in the medical program should be allowed in the so-called adult use program. And then the limited market for those medical products could grow with the economics and the economics for them would be improved. This is actually proven in other states that the, the um, when allowed by the regulators, you know, the innovativeness and the markets for the same products when they're allowed in adult use expands exponentially. So it's actually the regulatory schemata that is actually stopping that. So I would ask to not just consider us adult use, medical patients buy from everywhere or they grow or even elicit. Let's treat it that way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy. Um, Alexis? Uh, yes, um, I'm a person that uh, has been working with the mental health integration group um, for the last couple of years. And like six years ago, I, I mean, I've had extreme trauma in my life, which I didn't really face up to until six years ago when somebody, a friend of mine, said to try um, marijuana for my anxiety. Now, I'd smoked when I was young, and I'm sorry about my birds. They are very noisy. Um, I had smoked marijuana, you know, back in the 60s when everybody in college smoked marijuana at 18, and they were all, you know, those people now run the country, surprisingly. Um, but when I started to take, when the person that talked to me said, look, this is what you do. You take a little bit in the morning and a little bit at night. You don't need much. And I started doing that. And I couldn't believe how my, everything just started to change. I mean, with over the course of a few years, then we hit the pandemic and I was isolated for three months with only people who love me. And all of a sudden I had this awakening thing happen, which happens to a lot of people, not just me, <laughs> but a lot of people don't like to talk about it. But, um, but anyway, so I guess what I'm saying there is I'm on Dan's page that first of all, it made my driving a hundred percent better once I start started taking a little bit of marijuana in the morning and a little bit at night. And I, I, I just think that it's a godsend. I, I fought for my medical marijuana card two years ago, and I realized that most of the people that had it were, were veterans who had PTSD, because that's what I had, PTSD. And they finally gave it to me, but I had to fight for it. I had to go to a bunch of people. I had to get another doctor. I had to, but I finally got it. But I'm only saying this here to you now to help you understand that the mental health integration people are fighting <laughs> They're fighting not to do the thing where everybody's equal, which is Dr. Jane King, and I don't want to go on too much, has already adopted a CCBHC out in Minnesota and, and around the country. But for some reason, Vermont is fighting the equity thing. And I guess that's another subject. But, but I'm still on the planet, and I'm still helping my son and a lot of his high school friends to understand what I'm telling you now. Because... People have to understand that it's really about all of us being treated equally, even on the planet, even with religion. We need to go more universal. We can't, we just, anyway, I'm getting off topic. <laughs> I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> I just felt like uh, I thanks. had something here. That no, was thank cool. you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, I just want to um, just note that we have no control over the DUI laws, and those are not in the scope of this report, um, you know, it's yeah, and I do, I, I do understand that we just heard information that there's increased fatalities, and maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Um, I didn't, I haven't researched that report, but we just have no. It's just not part of the scope of this project. So, um, um, thank you for listening. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah, um, Amelia. Hey. Um. We met so early this morning that my brain just started functioning about 20 minutes ago. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> um, I just wanted to kind of make a suggestion to you guys because this meeting was announced very close to the actual meeting date. Um, 
which sort of made it difficult for those of us in like the advocacy space to get the information out to patients in time to get a good group of them here. Um, and I know that that's for a variety of reasons, uh, you know, <laughs> from resources to time management to all of that. Um, one suggestion I would like to make though is some sort of automated phone setup that goes out to every registered patient um, to inform them when there are meetings like this. Uh, you know, we've talked in the past about how a lot of registered patients are elderly um, or, you know, developmentally disabled. Some might be blind and unable to use things like, you know, visual aids. Uh, so I just think that some sort of automated phone call uh, that goes out every time there's a patient centered meeting or a patient topic um, being discussed would really help with turnout to these sort of things to kind of help collect a broader opinion than those of us that kind of show up and pair at the same points every week. Um, yeah, so that was just my suggestion. Uh, thanks for hosting this, guys. Thanks, Amelia. Um, Evo. Okay. Okay, so um, I don't have much to say. I, I'm very, very satisfied with what Dan said. And I listened to the uh, uh, providers and uh, dispensary uh, owners, uh, and um, I completely agree that the 25,000 versus 10,000 is too much. I mean, I, I think that both fees should be equal. You know, that would be much more fair. And I just hope that for our next meeting, you are going to bring an expert uh, with a different confirmation bias because now we have a guy with a confirmation bias that's against use. Um, he was very reluctant with everything, and uh, he's, he, the, the, the evidence for the benefits are inconclusive, but there are evidence of addiction and um, you know all sorts of negative things. So uh, I, I do want to see um, a little bit less biased expert next time in our meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Evo. Anyone else for public comment? And I don't think we have anyone who joined by phone. Um, but anyone else for public comment? Just raise your virtual hand, and jump right in. No? OK. Um, well, I'll close the public comment window and um, really appreciate everyone that joined. I feel like um, we are coalescing around some, um, you know, solid recommendations to actually improve the program, not make it more challenging. Um, I think historically it's been incredibly challenging um, to be a patient, to maintain your uh, patient card. Um, and so I, I think, you know, we're, we're moving in a positive direction. We're not trying to overcomplicate things. Um, and then, um, yeah, I just, uh, as far as notice, you know, I'm thinking the first week of December for the next meeting. Part of our patient survey, by the way, was asking if people wanted to be um, notified of meetings like this. Um, and we called through everyone that didn't have an email address. And, um, you know, we kind of have results as to who wants to be notified and who doesn't. So hopefully we will actually drive attendance um, to our next meeting and future meetings in this. So do you think we could put that online in the interim so people can see it? What's that? The results. Oh, the patient results? Yeah, yeah I think so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And we'll review them um, at the next meeting as well. Um, so with that, I think that's any other concluding thoughts? Nope. Thanks, everybody, for yeah. showing up bright and early. Yeah. Great. We'll see you next time. Thank you all. I adjourn the meeting. Bye. Peace.